Our discussant for this session is uh, Tom Vogt. I can tell he's got his hands full with this group, but uh, uh, he's a former senior investigator at Kaiser Permanente Center for Health Services Research. His work has, invest has uh, investigated improving prevention services in medical care settings, the quality and cost of preventive care, uh, primary care organization, and satisfaction with care across several states and multiple managed care systems. So he looks like he's more than prepared to deal with this group. So uh, without further ado, I'll, I'll uh, let Tom go ahead. Thank you. I'm not sure anyone is prepared to deal with this group, but I'll start out. <clears throat> I, I'm not going to show you slides. I, ha I made some, and I looked at them and didn't like them because as I thought about these papers, um, my sort of synthesis of them came together, and so I'm going to do this verbally. I do have slides, and you can they'll be in the, in the little thumb drive you got if you must see them, but they're not my preferred approach at this point. I want to start out by talking about <clears throat> what a practical multi-level intervention should have. What are the characteristics that we're shooting for here? Well, I thought about categorizing in light of the three presentations that you've just heard. And when I started that, I had notes all over the place. And as I looked at those notes, they sort of distilled down into the following points. One, a practical multi-level intervention should be broadly applicable. It should apply to a lot of folks, because otherwise you're wasting a lot of time and money on the few that it does apply to. It should be effective across multiple levels, which is both a design issue and, um, and a synergy issue. And we've been talking about both of those things. It should be adopted across multiple levels, um, which of course is a synergistic approach. It should be implemented faithfully, meaning that the design of what you put in place should reflect the knowledge base at the time you do the design of the study. It should learn from the past. And then finally, it should be maintained over a long period of time. The time issue that Dr. Alexander um, was discussing and they should be maintained not just in one level, but presumably in multiple levels, although that's a question in itself. Now, if you think about the points that I just made and you list them like I did, and you redefine them, they look a lot like um, reach, efficaciousness, adoption, implementation, and maintenance which using those terms you may have heard because Dr. Glasgow is the father and grandparent of the REAIM model and uh, sitting out there. And um, it seemed to me the REAIM model applies not just to single interventions, but it applies to how you would approach the design and the evaluation of multi-level interventions, considering all those elements. But it isn't sufficient. It's, it's a place to start. There are some badly needed things that we rarely discuss and that I'm going to take the opportunity of standing up here to mention because I think that in some ways our approach to behavioral in interventions in general is sort of like the, the story of the emperor's new clothes. And I, I should warn you, I'm going to use two cliches in this talk. Uh, and this is the first one, the emperor's new clothes. I, I think cliches are cliches because there's almost always some truth to them. Um, in the story of the emperor's new clothes, you will recall the emperor uh, was convinced to walk around naked. And um, his, he told everybody how wonderful and beautiful his new clothes were, so everybody believed him until some naive little child said he doesn't have any clothes on. And suddenly everybody realized that your child was right. Well, I think in our interventions there are some examples like that. Um, I think the most effective prevention intervention I have encountered in my entire career was the implementation of HEDIS standards for integrated healthcare systems in the early 1990s. 
In those days, integrated healthcare systems were being dogged by various contractors to give them data, and they all wanted something different. So they finally got together and agreed that NCQA would do these HEDIS standards, and everybody would be providing the same data. In a single year, immunization and screening rates increased by 50 to 100 percent in nearly all the participating healthcare systems. I challenge you to find any better intervention in all of our studies. 50 to 100 percent in one year. Why did that happen? It happened because the healthcare systems involved made a budget for doing it, and it happened because they made the people who were supposed to do it accountable for doing it and doing it right. And in one year, everything changed. Budget and accountability is something I never see in behavioral studies. I don't, it's not measured, it's not a variable, but it is crucial. If you don't have it in the budget, it, even if it's implemented, it will fade away. And I think we've all experienced that. Besides budget and accountability, it, the, the impact must be sustained over time. I think that there are some opportunities right now that are new for all of us as researchers that have not been available before that will help us do multi-level interventions, at least in healthcare systems, which is the one we're talking the most about. For those of you who haven't been, some of you in this room have been participating in these, but those who haven't, I think you may not realize the degree to which progress has been made in standardizing and collapsing across healthcare systems longitudinal electronic medical records data to ask questions at reasonable costs that we've never been able to ask before. Um, some of my colleagues and I have been doing this for more than 10 years in the Kaiser Permanente system, uh, which is just one member of the National HMO Research Network, which now has a, a virtual data warehouse that covers more than 15 million people across 18 healthcare systems. And um, it isn't easy, but it is now possible to collect data on total populations of healthcare systems over long periods of time, a decade or more. And that offers extraordinary opportunities to create historical prospective studies in ways that we've never been able to do before. Those don't prove necessarily um, that they're correct, but they give us a new avenue for um, developing hypotheses and looking at questions that we simply can't look at in randomized trials because they're too expensive and too long-term. So having said that, um, I, I would advise those of you who are interested to get in touch with some people who have worked with those kinds of data. Jane Zapka sitting down here has done that, and so have several others in this room. Uh, Diana Bust, I saw her somewhere. Uh, yeah, and um, I would like to finish by going back to my um, second cliche, which is the old story about the drunk who is crawling around on the ground and the policeman walks up and says, what are you looking for? And he says, my, my keys, I lost my keys. And the policeman says, well, where'd you lose them? And he said, well, over in the alley over there. And the policeman says, why are you looking for your keys here under the street light? And he said, because it's dark in the alley. And the point I am going to bring up with that, and I think this is crucial if we want to do effective multi-level interventions, if we want to address the problem that Dr. Kluzny raised this morning, that we ranked 36th in the world in life expectancy, but that was in the year 2000. In 2009, we ranked 52nd. So that's the direction that we're going. And um, that is, we have to acknowledge as researchers, even if our benefactors at the National Cancer Institute or other NIH institutes are not allowed to, to acknowledge, that the problem when we want to look at cost effectiveness and cost containment that is responsible for poor and overly expensive U.S. healthcare is largely not scientific, but social and political. And um, it was the original uh, proposals from the Obama administration to reform healthcare included clear uh, attempts to reduce costs. For example, the outrageous notion that Medicare might be able to negotiate drug prices. 
Congress refused to allow them to do that. All of the cost-cutting elements of, of the original proposals were stripped, which is pretty much what killed the 1994 or 1993 attempt at reform in the Clinton administration. Don't researchers have an obligation to start talking about the social and political contributions to ineffective and overly expensive care? Thank you.